to the VC and all the YouTube people. Just got a refill, put a little extra sugar in there to give it that kick. All right, always so many topics in my mind about music, hence why I love music so much. So, 2022, lots of stuff already coming out in the jazz realm, and for me, um, I try to keep up, but it, for me, it's got to sound good. Uh, if it doesn't, they all sound great, but it's got to connect with my ears, and I'm sure you guys are all the same with that one. Um, unless you're more more collector than more listener, and I get that. I have a very I have the collection side to me. I collect baseball cards, I collect comic books, and I still have them all. I have two complete sets of Wolverine, one through two hundred. I was thinking about the show. I have like Wolverine number one with autograph. I have Wolverine origin with the head sketch of Wolverine on the cover by the artist with the certificate of authenticity. Um, uh, anyways, I have some pretty interesting comic books, so I like to collect. I get that. I got VHS I collect, cassette tapes, rocks, old coins, you get the picture. Zippo lighters, watches, it's pretty weird. Um, but again, they got to sound really good. And I did get some killer VHS, I mean just to show you what I've stored recently. Some of these are a little bit older, but I mean I just got Predator for like a dollar, brand new. Two bucks, two bucks. Lethal Weapon, Steel Seal. I, I popped this open. It has a Walmart price tag on it still. And this was only like a dollar. Two bucks. Hand That Rocks the Cradle was a dollar. I mean, come on. You know what's funny about Hand That Rocks the Cradle? We're going to change topics for just a minute. These two I got when uh, we were traveling through Missouri at a secondhand store. And then this is mint condition. Die Hard. Two bucks. I have another copy of this. In my cabin. But, um... Hand that rocks the cradle. I want to talk about this for a second, and then we'll shift back to the music. Okay? Um, it's a movie about this lady who invades his home, becomes their, you know, um, day, day, daycare lady. Kind of Molly maid, helps with the baby. Played by Rebecca De Mornay. Rebecca De Mornay. Who, in her hey, I'm sure she probably looks decent now, but back in her heyday, this is dime piece right here, okay? I don't know if that's... I don't want to offend anybody by comparing these women to a dime, but that was a term. My dad would use a dime piece, I think. I don't even, I don't even know if my dad used that. Anyways, when I was a kid, I watched this. I went to the movies, and my mom used it. Scared me. I'm like, fuck, scary nanny in the house, right? I watch it as an adult. It's like a dream come true. First off, he has a snaggy wife who's not really that hot to begin with. She's always complaining. Hot nanny wanders into the home. Starts breastfeeding your baby, wants to kill the freaking naggy wife, and clean the fucking house. Holy shit! This is more like fucking. This is like this is more of a love story. I realize now, and you know, and the fact that the husband couldn't. He's like still trying to stick up for the grump. I mean, okay, maybe not kill the wife. Can we just intimidate her grumpy ass away to divorce and walk away with the hot one who's way more passionate about your child, obviously. Anyways, it's weird how. When you're a kid, you watch it, you're like, oh, she was scary. Now I'm like, I'm in love. I don't know. Maybe that speaks more with the issues I have. Anyways, back to the music. So a lot of stuff has been coming out in 2022. John Coltrane came out with the Live at the Village Vanguard. Even though I'm pretty sure they say 2021 on the back. That was released in 2022. I got the Live at Village Vanguard. I've been wanting to get that for a while. I've been listening to it. It's great. The day I went to get the Village Vanguard... They had a copy of this in stock also. And I, I haven't heard of this album. But I went there just to get the Village Vanguard. Went home, played the Village Vanguard, and just out of curiosity, I was like, what does this one sound like? I should give this one a listen. I was like, oh, wow. I should have got it. Went back to the store. It was gone. And I'm pretty sure the person who got this one wanted to get both. He probably wanted to get this in the life of the Village Vanguard. And... So it's kind of worked out, I think. I don't know this person, as could, I could be totally wrong on this, maybe they just wanted to get this one, but it's kind of like you gotta get them both, if you can. can afford it, get them both. If you're a John Coltrane fan, definitely a, a must. This is a, this is not a live album, but it's recorded live in the studio. Uh, but no crowd, you know, clapping afterwards. And it's got five songs, Crescent, Wise One, Crescent opens up, Kill It. Wise One opens up, Wise One's probably my favorite tune on this album right now, even though I love the whole album whole thing is really good but so anyway I once I realized 
how good this was. Went back, they didn't have a copy. I went and ordered one from Acoustic Sounds, and it, it took about a week to get here. Let's be real here. But it was in good condition. So, thank you. Um, they pulled through. And, uh, and the other one I've been listening to a lot is this Dexter Gordon. Hold on, hold on. This one. Wow. I have Dexter Gordon's Go, and it's amazing. But... This is a good album, really. There's only three songs on it. This, and the best way I can describe Dexter Gordon, he's more... Man. It's like he doesn't play as hard through his saxophone as other players. I would say him... It seems like him and John Coltrane are the smoothest. But John Coltrane plays a little louder, I feel, than Dexter Gordon. Uh, this album, Dexter Gordon... It could be where he was positioned to the microphone, but he's playing a little bit quieter, but real smooth. And uh, that song, Tanya, doesn't really get intense to, to my to the way it makes me feel, but it's a super, ch it's intense in the chill factor. Just like, wow, this is a good, this is a really nice, just killer music for the moment. Just when you're drinking, hanging out with a friend or by yourself and just reading a little bit, that, that's a great, definitely it's, it's a unique album. The recording on this one, right away I was like, this recording, I think I already kind of talked about this already, how it was recorded in the CBS studio uh, in Paris, France. And recording the recording engineer was Jacques Lubin. So anyways, it's a killer album. I have a good portion of the Tone Poet, but I don't have them all. Um, I was kind of late to the party on the Tone Poet series. Like, I didn't find out about it until like the beginning of Late in 2019, maybe, or the beginning of, like, the first one I got. Yeah, so yeah, 20, the first one I got was this Art Blakey. Let's see, and this one came out in, uh, so yeah, okay, 2020, beginning of 2020. Um, so yeah, yeah, because I got this for, for Christmas in 2020. So anyways, I got, a, I got a good portion of them, but I hadn't gotten this Dexter Gordon one. I really enjoy it. So, enough ramblings about that. But I also got in the mail. It's strange how you order a lot of this stuff, and then you order all separate times, and it all kind of shows up, like, on the same day, or, the couple, you know, with a couple days, like, two days was writing records. Um, Crowbar. Killer band out of Louisiana. The Nola scene, New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, this, uh, Kurt Weinstein is in... Uh, down. Um, Time Heals Nothing. This album came out in 95, I want to say. Came out in the mid-90s, I want to say. Uh, have the CD. It was pretty cool a long time ago when I got in the crowbar. I happened to go to the little music zone, this cool spot that wants to be, used to be my hometown I'm from, and then it moved to this beach town, which is still there. And, uh, they had a whole catalog of crow Somebody just sold their whole fucking discography. So I souped up every Crowbar album a long time ago. And this was one of them. But So I never had it on vinyl. Kind of got the curious, like, man, i never seen any Crowbar. I got an album from their show. And um, it's kind of like a greatest hits called the Setlist album. Really good. On purple vinyl, a little bit warped. This one is on clear vinyl. Check it out. It's pretty cool. Let me show it to you real quick. It's on 180 gram vinyl. But it's on this clear. This weird uh, yellow red splatter with the black in the center. Uh, not my favorite, but you know, pretty cool. Um, a little wobbly on one side, but it plays. It sounds great. And uh, this came out in 2020, they reissued this. Um, and I didn't see it ever, I didn't see any, maybe JG, maybe a JC, JJ, JC from the flip side might have mentioned this coming out, and I just missed the episode. Um, but either way, if you see, if you're a Crowbar fan, you know it's up there freaking sick. And now, let's get to this. This is the first album that I have that says 2022 on it, I'm pretty sure. Besides, oh wait, maybe this, the Crescent one does too. I'm kind of a numbers person here, but uh, let me look here. Oh no, this one says 2021, but it was released in 2022. So anyways, um, this one is Don Cherry album came out in 2022, even though it, they had to have pressed it in, maybe not, maybe they just pressed this at the, at the very beginning of January and they got him out, so anyways, I know who Don Cherry is, I really, I can't say I have any of his albums in my collection, I might, he might be on one of the albums 
as a, as he's playing on another person's album, but I don't say I have any Don Cherry. I try to get that Japanese pressing of uh, that rare performance that was recorded in Denmark, I think, but I didn't get it. So this came out, gave it a listen on YouTube, was like, holy shit, this is badass. Um, probably this, this Blue Mid Midnight Blue or Blue Midnight, whatever you call the Kenny Burrell one, Midnight Blue is, I'm pretty sure it is. And Out for Lunch, Eric Dolphy. And this one are my favorite. Those are the three of my favorite of the classic series. Um, everything in the classic series is good. It really just depends what you... Well, okay, hold on. The Mo McCoy Tyner and the Lee Morgan are really good also. But, so let's go with five. I'm going to add this to the gang of five. And uh, I got it playing right now. I don't think it's going to get flagged because of how chromatic it is. So hopefully, and if you're like, what does chromatic mean? The major scale has seven notes with all the sharps in there. That's you got 12 tones chromatic in the chromatic scale. And, uh, and jazz people get down with that. A lot of times it's kind of funny if you have a real jazz guru. What key are we playing? And they almost laugh at you. Yeah, because they change keys so much, but they're like, oh, we need the first chord. Anyways, uh, Don Cherry, Where is Brooklyn? Really cool album cover. And Michael from 45 RPM, he said this should have, you know, it would have been cool if this was the Tone Poet series. And I agree, because I don't really know if this was more obscure, but it seems like Michael was saying, you know, this seems like this is more of an obscure album. And probably, you know, just imagine a gatefold with this one. Oh. Um, but nonetheless, you get it for 20, 25 bucks, 23. If you go through 45 RPM, he's got links to Amazon, so either way, try to help a, help a homie out in the VC. And, uh, but this is a great album. And uh, it was recorded in 66, November 11th. And for some reason, it didn't get released till originally released in 69. And, uh, but what's crazy is that they recorded this in 66. This is four years before Bitches Brew. And now, it doesn't have the electric keyboards and all that stuff, but, a guitar, but, Don Cherry was doing some weird shit, it seems like, before a lot of the other people were. And I, I mean, throw a comment if you know a little bit more about this. Um, but, great album, cool color. I've been leaving a couple of subs to get some more keys. I've been cutting open just to kind of protect them, but I, once I get the plastic, I'm going to pull this whole thing off, but, whatever you like to do, but, really cool album cover. Where is Brooklyn? I, mean, I got to play Brooklyn when our band was on tour. The, one of the first times we toured New York, we played in Brooklyn. Um, I think it was called the Tip something hall. And uh, I shit you not, it's crazy how New York is. We pull into New York, we're going through the woods, and then I'm like, there's no way. This, like, it said New York City is five minutes away, and the way we were at are coming in. I can't remember exactly where we were coming from. Probably from west through New York State somewhere. Anyways, um... New York opened up, and I just tripped out how big it was. Like, just from that scene that I almost ran into the first person, because I just, it was crazy to see. Well, there was a lady walking, and she's walking in flip-flops. Okay, I see her just because she was walking, like, either along the overpass, and I was just thinking, like, wow, you know what I mean? Just be walking in your flip-flops in New York City, you gotta, you know I mean? Definitely a local. We get all the way to the venue. Now, this, mind you, this is like driving... Wow. I want to say 40 minutes of driving. We finally get to this venue. One way street, cars parked on both sides. For when the fire truck came through, the fire truck had dudes on the side pushing the rear view mirrors of cars inwards so this fire truck could barely squeeze through. I shit you not, I think I already said that phrase a couple times now, but I'm sitting there in front of this venue and I'm just like, wow, I'm taking it in New York. I'd. I took my nylon string, string guitar and played a little bit on the stairs in this building next to it. And uh, that lady we seen walking right when we pulled into New York walked by the venue. I mean, what are the fucking chances of that? But what's crazy, she had to have walked a fucking walk a long ways. And she wasn't, you know, complaining, it seemed like, but I, I was like, God, and she didn't look homeless or anything. You know, this is just like fucking maybe what you gotta do when you live in New York sometimes. But, uh, <laughs> either way, that's one of my strange memories of Brooklyn, New York. And then, um, went to this cool little shop across the street and then had some cool shirts and little postcards. I got the cool postcard where it has all the jazz artists in front of that building. I'm pretty sure it was, I think the building might be in Harlem, actually. But 
but I think there's a possibility it was taken in Brooklyn, but I could be wrong. Um, and I guess David Byrne lived really close by from the Talking Heads, and he goes on daily bike rides and rides his bike right, right, where you know, right through that street. So, anyways, New York, amazing, beautiful place. Now, um, that was in 2013. We got to go back every year for a while. Last time I went, we did 2019. So, thankful I got to see New York in 2019. Cause I'm sure, you know, things are a little bit different now, obviously. But either way, still go and check out New York City if you get the opportunity. Um, and Niagara Falls, you'll see that's not that's in Niagara, New York. But if you're in that general area, go hit up. It's beautiful. We kind of just happened to be playing in Niagara, and we're like, oh, fuck, let's go see Niagara Falls. And that was the band Hate for State. Sometimes people see my hat. I just you know the Hate State, and the four is kind of small. And that band, we came up with a name. Basically, we started this band when we were teenagers. We were going to play a house party. We were like, fuck, let's come up with a name. We did not try to, you know, like you see these bios on big bands, how they, they put a lot of time in coming up with a name. Some maybe didn't. We didn't. It was like, I think one day we had one name, and the next day we had this, and we were like, let's put it on. Let's tell people that's the name of our band that's playing at a party in a garage. And the cops came and broke it up and made us pour all the beer out, which we have on film. That was in 99. And so anyways, uh, and then just we were playing parties and it just stuck. And then we recorded some shit. And then we went on a little mini tour in 2006 and it just kept going in something. But it was all DIY. And then the name. And, but our lyrics are not hateful or like it's all our lyrics are about like uh, be yourself, stay true, go, you know. Follow your dreams, all that good stuff. And uh, my bass player writes the majority of the lyrics, but I've written a handful of songs. Uh, usually I sing a few songs in each record. Uh, it seems like it started off with one song on one record, then two, and then gradually I'm also singing like three or four songs on, on, album, on an album. But um, but we got to, you know, we get to do our, our uh, traveling, and we haven't been able to since 2019. We were thinking about doing one this year, but uh, we were just like... Uh, We'll see. We probably won't do it, though. Um, but definitely next year, we're going to go hit the road. So what's up with that? We did get to at least play one show in 2021. It's crazy, though. In 2020, we didn't play at all like you know, anyone else, like most bands. And that was the first time in 20 years of not playing for a whole year, which was uh, miserable. <laughs> but it is what it is. We still got to... Um, like we still got to FaceTime and all that good stuff. And uh, I still got to play some shows with some other people and all that stuff. So anyways, a bunch of, well, yeah, I'm going off topic here, but that's what it is. It's all about just rambling here, getting out of the system. I'm having my cup of coffee with the vinyl community and the YouTube community. It's pretty crazy how YouTube's gotten so, I mean, it's been big for a while now, but I can remember when I had this instructional, this, I had this, I just got this. Let's see, where is it at? <clears throat> okay they didn't have this on DVD back in the day this is the only way you can get this on VHS and to, to study the great Sean Lane and there's live footage on here and I think it even came up. this one doesn't have the tab but he breaks down stuff and you, when you the harsh realities you find out Sean Lane is not only a freak of nature and uh, like a Beethoven his hands are huge not long fing not like, like, oh, like long fingers his hand's really wide. You, you, you'll you start to notice that this dude's got a hand that's about that much wider than a normal person's hand. This is what... And he can do intervals that will basically injure a normal person's hand. You you won't be able to stretch your fingers out. Some can. Some can pull it off. But if you can't do it naturally, it's hard to really force it. It's one of those things you can't force quickly. You'd have to really just study Sean Lane. But he does a lot of other stuff, too, where he's not stretching these big intervals. He's just... He points out this magical thing about how... When you group notes in odd numbers, it causes way more tension. So instead of like Zach Wilde and Eric Johnson do this riff, it's in groups of six. One, two, three, four, five, 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 six. But Sean Lane will do it in groups of five. He'll mix it up. He'll start with a group of five. Go back down, do a group of three. Go back up and do a group of seven. Go back up and do a group of three. I mean, so this is total, you, you were really hard to predict this playing. So anyways, got this on VHS and my good friend was like, dude, this is on YouTube. I'm like, what's YouTube? And he's like, it's, 
It's this, it's this new straight, it's this new thing where you can just go and you can watch all these live concerts. It's tons of guitar instructional videos on there. He's like, you don't even need to buy a good, another guitar instructional video ever. And I'm like, really? He's like, dude, every Paul Gilbert, he's always tons of Buckethead footage because Buckethead was, there was not that, there was like very obscure to see Buckethead playing that you went to see him live. But so, what's crazy, I didn't even go check it out. I'm tripping out because I guess this case is kind of breaking here. Um, so, I'm in the um, computer lab one day, and uh, my friend comes in there, he's like, did you check out YouTube? And I'm like, no, and he just like pushes me over. He's like, what do you want to watch? He's like, Sean Lane. And I was blown away. I was like, so I just started after he, one of the first things I did was UFO crash. And what's crazy, back then there was this one clip, and it's still on YouTube, you have to search for it, and it's fucking weird. It's convincing, it's something goes and then it hits the ground goes in the ground torques out and then goes and explodes when crazy when it explodes it's such a big explosion there's no gas explosion but this debris goes for like miles it's going so fast no, footage is still on there it's and it, it's even stranger it's in new mexico so i tripped out and find this weird footage of a fucking ufo wreck right so then i just started putting in a bunch of bands of i couldn't believe like there was footage of death row toll there was footage of rush there was footage of sean lane buckethead i mean I started doing punk bands, you know, I was like, there was a lot of, even back then when it was a lot of obscure footage of these punk bands, like Minor Threat or Bad Religion or Descendants and Black Flag. And, and uh, so it was kind of, a tr it was like, wow, this like, every day I would go in the computer lab, I would freaking just watch live music, you know what I mean? And there, <laughs> I couldn't believe how much stuff was on there already. And it could, it might've only been up for a year by that time. Maybe a little over a year, but, you know, I mean, people were already just uploading a shit ton of footage back then. Now, what's crazy, I had no idea that I could st start my own YouTube channel back then. Now, probably a good thing I did it, because I'm, uh, yeah, I mean, it's going to be on the YouTube realm forever. But, for the people that did, have that head start, you know what I mean? So, some of those people would end up have a lot of shit ton of subscribers now because they just got it. They had a good content and they got it early in the game. You know what I mean? And uh, I, I wasn't even think that way. I was just like so blown away that there was so much music on there. You know what I mean? So, and, uh, but it's crazy. It was crazy to where it was still kind of underground in the sense to where YouTube's huge now. I mean, you have these podcasters on there and like a lot of people now are getting their news. More people are watching YouTube than are watching cable at this point. I'm pretty sure. So um, YouTube has turned into a big thing, but it was, it's cool to be able to look back and be like, I remember when it was so small. I'm sure a lot of you my age or older recall that. So anyways, in on that one, uh, go, go in 25 minutes. I was going to try to keep this in 10 minutes, but so be it. If you hung in there this song, thanks for hanging out this song. If you only watched a little bit, that's also great. Um, sometimes I, I, I watch a lot of videos. Sometimes if they're lingering on topic like I do, I'm sure you guys are a little fast forward here with see the next album. Or if, if the topic at hand is something I'm really interested in, then I'm glued to it. And that's 99% of the time. It's only a couple times I fast forward through certain things. Um, the in is one of the ones I kind of fast forward through when he's showing the new arrival stuff. Just kind of get uh, see what's in there. Uh, uh, nothing against uh, him hearing him ramble on. But, you know, it happens. And, uh, and on the VHS scene, do you got anybody else a weirdo? I, um, I've had a bunch of VCRs. And what's crazy, right now, if you look online, it was like a VCR DVD player. is like going for $300 now. Kind of crazy. But uh, I might have showed this. I can't remember. Yeah, I think I did already. But got the Quantum Leap, finally opened it up. It's pretty cool. So I thought I had all five seasons on separate. And I don't. I only have the first two seasons. So I was stoked to. This has three, four. It has all five seasons. Even though I have all five seasons in a portable hard drive to watch. But this is one of my favorite shows when I was a kid. I uh, Yeah, one, one more rant. I got kicked out. Let's see, I was kind of one of those kids that just didn't shut the fuck up. Well, actually, I was kind of quiet. But I, it's if I did something, it would, you know, it was gonna it was going to be a banger. But it was going to be funny. I wasn't, like, trying to be crazy crazy as far as, like, getting in trouble hardcore at school. But, uh. Whatever they didn't, they didn't want me. So they threw me in independent studies in seventh grade, and so my routine it was two hours of class a day. So I would go, go to skate to school, do two hours of not anything, and then go home and watch 
Quantum Leap and Murder, She Wrote. So I, I was like an old soul at 13 years old. It was hilarious. And uh, I watched every single episode all the way to the last episode. And comment if you watched the last episode. Super sad. But if you know what happens, you, you know why it's a sad episode. So anyways... Totally pissed me off. I was like, what? Why did they end it that way? Gosh, damn. But it was kind of a crazy thing because it was like to go through the whole thing. What's really even more strange is my dad, uh, who's not here with us anymore, he was really out there uh, in a good way. And uh, my dad was homeless. I mentioned this a few times. And uh, and uh, what he was very into time traveling. Uh, he wrote about it a lot. He wrote this book called Time Traveling. Was Don Stone, which is about this reporter who knows this time traveler, Don Stone, and Don Stone time travels and then tells this reporter who I think was the reporter. The name of this reporter in the book is what my dad went by. This what's it called? It when you go with a different name, alias or something like that. Anyways, he had this different name for a while, and so I feel like that was his character. But he also went by the name of the time traveler for for a while, Don Stone. So my dad was big on changing his name and stuff, and. Um, but he was very big into time travel. He was, so even when I was in sixth grade, I wrote a story about time travel, about time traveling back to the pyramids and stuff. And um, and it was a disc you would have to spin. If you spent it clockwise, it went to the future. If you spent it counterclockwise, it went to the past. And all these microchips, and all the it was all on this disc. All the the science behind time traveling. <laughs> but so it's kind of ironic that my dad and I, when I was watching this. I already knew my dad was into time traveling, but it was uh, the, it wasn't why I liked the show. The show was just really good. It was a strange coincidence that my dad was into time travels. Uh, I ended up being, and it's still one of those things I'm fascinated by because you there's proof you can time travel into the future. I mean, no, that's a fact. If you can go even a you know a small percentage of the speed of light, uh, time slows down. So you know, I mean, even on the plane, your watch slows down a billionth of a second. Not a whole lot, but it does slow down. A mechanical watch will slow down by going 500 miles per hour. So, uh, why that's just weird. The faster you go, time slows down. So, you can go out in space, go about 30,000 miles per hour, come back. You've only aged a little bit, and Earth has aged a bunch. So, that's how you can time travel into the future. Pretty strange. Now, the quantum leap the reason that term is quantum leap when atoms are fucking, uh, I'm gonna forget the, the photons, they do this thing inside the atom. And every now and then, these little fucking things will jump to the other fucking side. And they have no idea, they don't know how this happens. And they call it a quantum leap. Because this thing literally is disappearing and then popping up somewhere else. And um, maybe some of you math nerds, they might have figured out more on that one. So, the quantum leap term, uh, you know, either they used it as, you know, I mean, that was what the machine would do. If, to shoot you in a time. It was, they called it a quantum leap. So anyways, that's where that term comes from. So anyways, later guys. Stay positive. Play lots of vinyl. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye.